Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Go ahead and get out your King James Bibles, where you find God's perfect written word for English-speaking people. This is my foundation on matters of faith and practice, and I pray that, if you're watching this, that it's your foundation on matters of faith and practice. King James Bible. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Another uh, part of the Remember Me series that we've been doing, um, Remember Me. We're going to talk about Hannah and compare Hannah to Rachel in the Old Testament. And uh, if you hear the feet moving, <laughs> that's Victoria coming back in. I'm Andrew Schnauzer. Um, but we're going to compare Rachel, Hannah and Rachel, and then we're going to talk about trusting God. All right? In these last days, it seems like a lot of things are going on out there in the world. And it seems like we're forgetting who it is that's in charge, who it is that's in control of everything that's going on in the world. And... We're forgetting to trust God. So let's start the study of 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Right? And if you see me reading from over here, because I'll be looking over here, it's because I have highlights in my notes, and not all everything's highlighted yet in my, my Bible yet. Because I do like highlighting. Let's see. Find a good page. I do like, I don't know if it comes through. I do like colors and highlighting, but sometimes it's not highlighted here, and I've got specific things I've got highlighted over here that I want to express and talk about. So 1 Samuel 1, chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to start there. Now there was a certain man of Rathamazephim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanan. Cana, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. The son of Jerome, the son of Elhu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrodite. 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 And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Silo. And the two sons of Eli... Ephani and Phineas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanan offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. That's very important there. The Lord shut up her womb. Uh, I'll say this because I want to read the whole thing, but I, I'm going to stop here for a second to say this. There's great teachings, Bible teachings, to prove that throughout the whole Bible that God's the one in charge of who has children and who doesn't have children. Okay, That's why I'm 100% against abortion or birth control of any kind, period, for whatever reason. Okay, It, goes, it makes it where you're taking an authority out of God's hand and you're trying to put authority in your own hand. All right? Those are all sins. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. Okay, I'm sorry, number six. And he and her adversaries also provoked her sore. I'll stop there for a second. You do realize today we're it's, everything is just so messed up out there today. A little girl that's born and grows up, they grow up playing house, playing with dolls, playing house with that heartfelt desire to be a good wife someday, a mother, and have children. That was the predominant thing that women would always grow up with that heartfelt desire. And if it didn't happen, it's not because they failed the Lord, but they feel like it sometimes. I have sisters in Christ out there that feel like it sometimes. God's the one that calls you to marriage. You're always supposed to have a heartfelt desire for it as women and men. Be ready. But God's the one that calls you to marriage. God's the one that calls you to have children. Okay? God does. And when it doesn't happen, sometimes uh, the enemy, the adversaries, will provoke you hardcore and make fun of you that you have no children or that you're still single and you don't have a husband. But what we're talking about here, children, they're provoking her sore with her adversaries. I believe it's the other wife and there's her children, the adversaries, provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. There again, it says the Lord did it. The Lord shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she, so she provoked her. I believe it's talking about the, ex -wife, uh, the other wife. 
Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elaikon, sorry about that, Victoria, her husband to Hannah, Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Okay? Sometimes as men, we forget that that's not supposed to be, it's, it's built in. That's supposed to be a heartfelt desire of women to get married and have children someday. Hannah's married, but she doesn't have any children. Mm -hmm. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And he was in the bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she, I'm sorry, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O oh Lord, remember who she's going to, O oh Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And we're going to stop right there, because the points that I'm trying to make, we've come across. She says, remember me. And these studies, brothers and sisters Christ, what I'm trying to impress on you, brothers and sisters Christ, is that oftentimes bad things will happen to us, or we'll be in want, or we'll be in need, so that we, when we say, remember me, Lord, what are we doing when we say, remember me, Lord? We're looking up. We start remembering God. Who it is that's in charge. Right here. God's the one that's prevent, uh, withholding her womb. Prevent her from having children. God's the one that's in charge. Lord, you're the one in charge. That's who we're supposed to be going to. And when things are happening, we need to trust the Lord. But there's three points I want to point out here before we get into Rachel. Okay, if you don't know Rachel, Leah and Rachel, the wives of Jacob. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the three points is, number one, but the Lord had shut up her womb. She acknowledged who it was that was in charge. Who shut up her womb? She remembered the Lord. And saying, remember me, she was remembering the Lord. Number two, her adversaries provoked her sore. She was vexed because people were putting her down and making fun of her that she has no children. And this can be about anything, but right now we're just talking about the context here is children, but they can be making fun of you because you're not married. They can be making fun of you for whatever reason, but God, because God has you in a certain state because He's in charge. But here, her adversaries provoked her sore. And number three, Hannah went to who? The Lord. And she said, remember me. She went to God Almighty, who's in charge. Remember me. Turn to Genesis 29. Turn back to Genesis 29. Now let's look at Rachel. and Let's compare the two. Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my afflictions. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard, I was Hated. He hath therefore given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore will I call his name Levi. Verse 35, And she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. Okay. Sorry there. Now I'm not comparing Leah, but Leah and Hannah is like in the same position. They're, they're frowned upon. They're being persecuted in some way. Leah's uh, being hated. 
and God is blessing them, but God's the one that's blessing them. And Leah gave God the glory. But let's keep going to Genesis 30, chapter 1. Let's keep going. Now let's see how Rachel responds. When Rachel saw that she was bare, that, I'm sorry, saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Did she go to God? Verse 2, And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead? You're going to the wrong person. Am I in God's stead? Who hath we held, withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? You see here with Rachel, the three things is, Am I in God's stead? Who hath we held thee from the womb? Where did Rachel go? She went to Jacob. It's your fault. You're supposed to give me children. It's your fault. Two, Rachel envied her sister. Okay. She wasn't being persecuted. She wasn't being hated. It was jealousy. She envied her sister. She's got kids and I don't. Where are my kids? That's what she was motivated by. Envy. Not by that heartfelt desire that I want to have kids and like Hannah. Hers was based off of envy. Three. Said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. And when you compare the two... Okay. But the Lord shut up her womb for Hannah. Would Rachel, this is Hannah, would Rachel do? She claimed that she blamed Jacob. The Lord didn't shut up my womb, it's Jacob's fault. Rachel envied her, I'm sorry, uh, her absence provoked her sore. Hannah, she was being put down. Okay, they provoked her sore. You don't have children, ha ha, mocking her, laughing at her, making fun of her, making her feel bad because she had no children. Rachel over here just envied her sister. Jealousy. I'm going to use the word envy. I don't want to add to the word of God. Envied her sister. So forgive me, brother. But envied her sister. She's got that. I want that. She didn't want children just to have children. She wanted to be as good as her sister or better. Three, Hannah went to the Lord. Hannah went to the right person. Lord, remember me. Lord, you're the one keeping me from having children. Lord, you're the one that's in charge. What did Rachel do? Rachel said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. You give me children. She didn't go to, she didn't go to the Lord. Okay. Now Leah, in that same passage that we just read there, Leah... You know, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, kind of hurt going through some hard times, just like Hannah was going through, he opened up her womb. But it was the Lord that did it. Number two, the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. This is what Leah was saying. The Lord had looked upon my affliction. The Lord was the one that gave me children. He's the one that's in charge. Verse three, now will I praise the Lord. Who does she give glory to? God. God puts us in a position that many, many times in our life, not that we say, God, remember me, it's so that we can remember who's in charge. God is. So we can remember who it is that we need to be going to. We're not supposed to be going and trying to do things of our own power, our own accord. We're supposed to go to God first. That's why I say a lot of times, Brother Jesus Christ, when it comes to prayer, that you need to take it to God in prayer yourself first. One-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord in prayer. Okay. Now, remember Leah, I believe, in this context, what we just read there. Leah is a type of servant of the Lord, while Rachel is a type of a person of the world. A servant of the world. Someone who's worldly. Okay. How we know this? If you read the whole story, we're not going to get into it, but if you read the story... Uh, Leah, uh, Rachel stole her father's idols. Leah didn't. Leah didn't care about worldly. I'm, I love the Lord. I love my husband. I love the Lord. Okay. Rachel stole her father's idols. And then later on, they got rid of all their idols and one of their travels. And Rachel changed a little bit. And we'll see that. I'm going to read this. But 
She's very worldly. Give me children or else I die. She goes to the world for the answers. She goes to the world for the solution. She didn't go to the Lord. While Leah is praising the Lord and giving God glory and credit, Rachel wasn't. Now later on, uh, remember Rachel in Genesis, uh, you don't turn there, but Genesis 30, chapter 22, and God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened up her womb. And Rachel ended up having two children. Okay, Benjamin and uh, Joseph. He, she started getting back on the right path, okay? But what helped her get back on the right path? I believe is because she had to get to a point where she had to know who she was supposed to go to. God. God, God hearkened unto her. She called out to God. God hearkened unto her. Instead of blaming her husband, instead of being worldly, getting rid of those idols, she had to come to God and realize God's the one in charge. Brothers and Christ, when we say, remember me, okay, when I'm please, when you say, Lord, remember me, you can go through the hardest time ever and you think God forgot you when the chances are, not chances, but we can use the word chance, but it's more likely that you're starting to forget God. When you go through hard times, tough times, things aren't going your way, you're not getting what you want or need, um, when you call out and say, Lord, remember me. Lord, why is this happening? Why? Have you forgotten? The Lord's like, no, you've forgotten me. Not me, but the Lord. You've forgotten the Lord. You've forgotten. The Lord's saying, you've forgotten me, and I need you to come back to me and talk to me. Okay. Why does God allow bad things to happen to us or for us to be in want? Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Now I want to start that with the story of Leah, Rachel, and Hannah to show the difference between the two. Someone who says, remember me, they're going to the Lord. They're going through hard times and you go to the Lord and say, remember me, but you're also remembering who it is that's in charge. And God wants that. He wants you to come to Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Of 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Is it, is it not, I'm sorry, it is not expedient for me to doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, words that can't be uttered down here, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory. Of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool. Now a good lesson to learn from this, Paul, I believe Peter... I'm sorry, Paul, what Paul is saying is that our eyes are supposed to be on things that are eternal. Remember the verse about instead of being on things that are temporal, we're supposed to have our eyes on things that are eternal? Sometimes you can fall into the trap of acting like a fool, brothers of Christ. Remember I said acting, not being one. That's why he's saying, I desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. He's not going to be a lost person again. He knows that this world has nothing to offer in a sense that there's people that try to live their dream life here. They want their heaven on earth right now. They want everything to be perfect. I want, I want, I want to do things my way. I want to live how I want to live and everything. And it's like, uh, Paul's like, uh, I got my eyes on heaven. That's who I'll glory. People who've made it to heaven. I'm not talking about earned right to heaven. I'm talking about people that have died and gone to heaven. Or this man here, which I believe he's talking about himself when he got stoned, that he got to see the vision of heaven. Those people that are in heaven right now, those are who I'll glory because I'm going to be there someday. I'm not there yet, but that's what I'm looking forward to. That's my heartfelt desire, is to be with the Lord someday. That will be perfection. That will be, you know, the perfect life. But if you start glorying in things down here, you start acting like the lost world. Fools. 
who think this is more important than that up there. I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. When it comes to men in ministry, you know why men in ministries are supposed to be poor? Not supposed to be, but, you know, we're not supposed to be like living it up and look at me, I'm great and I'm perfect and I'm all that. Because people will start worshiping that man. And I see it a lot among the body of Christ. Uh, uh, respecter of persons. Man worship, and it's not Jesus Christ they're worshiping. They're worshiping that man that's being put up on a pedestal. And Paul's like, God keeps me down. There's times where I'm dirt poor because that's how God keeps me down and keeps people saying, hey, I'm just like you. I'm a brother and sister in Christ, just like you. I'm not above you. I'm not to be worshipped as God. Okay, To be exalted above measure. To keep us down. Okay? That's why we don't always, remember what I was asking, why does God allow bad things to happen to us or for us to be in want? Well, we don't get everything we want. We're still in want. We don't have what we desire. Because it keeps us down. It keeps us humble. Okay? It keeps us with true grace. It keeps us with true charity and humbleness. It keeps us humble. And it keeps us from being exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Paul's like, I didn't want it. I wasn't desiring it. I sought, besought the Lord thrice. Lord, this is painful. You're living hard times. Barely being able to eat. One or two pairs of clothing. Just barely getting by day to day. You have that heartfelt desire to have that off-grid property and land and everything, and you don't have it. Or that, uh, you know, hut by the ocean, you know, or the log cabin, or the uh, condominium. I forgot what the words are, but like an apartment in this city, a nicer apartment, a nicer place to live. You have all these desires, but you don't have it. Okay. And you're like, Lord, why can't I live better than this? Why can't I have this? Why can't I have... Why is it... If you're going to the Lord saying that, at least you're remembering it's the Lord that's in charge. But there's some people that will start grumbling and they'll start forcing it to happen and trying to make it happen of their own power through the world, doing the world's way, being worldly. All right. But he asked the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. I remember us talking in another study where we talked about how Paul does not wish that, uh, I wish that you were, when, um, I think it was Pilate, not Pilate, um, that's not, um, where he's talking to a king, he's in bonds, and he says, I wish thou was saved also as I am this day, except these bonds. He, Paul doesn't wish people to suffer. He doesn't want people to hurt. He understands that it's going to happen. He understands that sometimes it's for God's glory. It, it happens to bring people to their knees so they'll get saved. It brings Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, to their knees so they'll humble themselves because they've gotten so prideful and arrogant and puffed up. You know, the, loving to be exalted by all, above all measure. It'll happen to God's glory, but as a Christian, we are not to desire that to happen to people, bad things to happen to people. Okay, If it happens pray, and it's to God's glory, praise God. But that it might depart from me. Be like, I don't want this. I want it to depart from me. Verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You realize, brothers of Christ, that if we got everything we wanted and we were living a perfect life down here, like our heaven on earth, our our in this state with this wicked sinful flesh, we would drift away from the Lord and say, We don't need you. I don't need you. Oh yeah. One of, the, one of the biggest reasons that we go through hard times down here is so we keep trusting the Lord and relying on the Lord, realizing that this world isn't it. This is temporary. This world is wicked. It's falling apart. But that we truly give our lives to Jesus Christ and live for Him every day and realize that we need to stay focused on Him and not focused on this world. Okay. Say, love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
There's nothing in this world that's worth you taking your eyes off Jesus Christ and forgetting eternity. And there's some people, some brethren, it's a warning to some of the brethren that you're starting to take your eyes off Jesus Christ and you're putting it on the world. You're getting distracted by the world and what's going on in the world and, and I don't know if we can handle it. Tough times are coming and this and that. Uh, uh, what about going to the Lord and trusting the Lord and going to Him in, in prayer? Lord, help us. If there's tough times truly coming, Lord, watch over the brethren. That's my prayer. Provide for the brethren, but mainly watch over them and help them stay true to you no matter how tough it gets in this world, how much we've talked about Leah and them, how much they're hated. Remember what Jesus said, if they've hated me, they'd hate you. No matter how much you're hated in this world, no matter how much suffering you go through, or people putting you down making fun of you, no matter how much you go through, even it comes to the point of death, being tortured and dying for the Lord Jesus Christ, the real prayer is no matter how tough it gets out there, that those brethren, including me, will keep our eyes on the Lord and be faithful to Him. Okay. Strength is made perfect in weakness. Remember Paul and Peter and John being arrested, beaten? What do they do? They sing praises to the Lord. They sing hymns. They praise God and they sing hymns. Their strength is made perfect in weakness. Their strength isn't made perfect if they're super strong of their own accord. It doesn't work that way. Verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. And what he means by that is when bad things happen to him, and it's not of his doing, okay, because we're going to talk about this a little bit, it's not of his doing, in other words, bad things can happen to me because I sin, I make bad choices, I get back into doing things the world's way, you can try to resurrect the old man, things fall apart, you lose your peace, you lose your joy, bad things happen to you because of you. Okay, But there's times that when bad things happen because you're doing right, you're trying to live right and live for the Lord and everything. And the world's attacking you and bad things are happening. Okay, Now this is just a small example. I'll give a small example. The three uh, glass bulbs covers, I'm trying to think of the right name for them, but covers for my outdoor lights, all three of them need to be replaced. So I went down, and gas is getting expensive, so I try not to go into town, but like once a week. And so I went into town yesterday, that was my once a week trip, I went in there and got these uh, covers for the light bulbs outdoors, and I came and went and to put them, to go to put them on, and they're too small. All three of them are too small. And praise the Lord that when I was lost, I would throw a fit. I would have thrown a fit, lost my temper a little bit, not hardcore, but I'd lost my temper and just got mad, and I'd have been moody the rest of the day, like, oh, this is, I'll have to go back into town and waste gas because it's a 10, it's like a 20 minute round trip, sometimes 30 minute round trip, uh, going into town and coming back from where I live. Um, and instead, I was just looking at that going, huh, I guess I gotta go back in town. We can, I guess I'll go back tomorrow, Lord. I got the wrong ones, I'm sorry, Lord. Uh, put them back in the bags. The stickers are still on them. Praise the Lord. And I put them back in the truck. And I, I'm going to take them back. And I sat here, and I started talking with the Lord about the Bible study that we're doing right now, and some of the work, physical work that, else that I was getting done in the garden and around the house. And I talked to the Lord and said, Lord, we're going to have to go back. I hope they have the right size because I grabbed the wrong size. And the Lord put it in my heart. And says, Friday, which is tomorrow, Friday. Don't you got to take Victoria in for a haircut, my miniature schnauzer? Don't you got to take her in for a haircut? It's every other month. I've been trying to save money doing it every other month. It's that time of the month. That's that time of the month, two months. Uh, aren't you taking her in? And I'm like, oh, yeah, i got to go back into town Friday anyway. And I can take those things in with me. And it works together for good. Praise the Lord. Okay. We need, and that's just something small. It's not important. It's not that important. I don't, it's not, I don't want it raining with those covers not on there, because I don't this the system's really old outside, all the light and wiring. It's an old house. But that's just something small and simple. We need to have that attitude when major things happen. Okay. Um, when my I don't talk about it much, but when my daughter passed away, uh, I had to talk to the Lord a lot. I put a lot of faith in the Lord, trust the Lord, and talk to the Lord, and it's like 
when hard things happen, times happen, we go to the Lord. There's, uh, don't get me wrong, I question the last, like, Lord, why did this happen? And I talked to the Lord, and He, he put my heart at ease. Okay? All things, we're going to get to that verse, all things work together for good. Okay? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may, may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, not just infirmities, but in reproaches and necessities, being in need, uh, and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The scenario I gave about the lights for the outdoors, the three lights I had, on, first thing I did is start talking to the Lord. I was like, Lord, these don't fit. I put them in, I, I screwed the screw, because there's a screw that screws in all the way that holds the glass in. I screwed it in and went to let go, and it fell back off into my hand, praise the Lord, into my hand. And I was like, what's going on here? And I had the screw in all the way, and it's like, ah. Oh. Then I found one of the broken ones, and I found the rim, and I was like, okay, the rim is actually a tad bit bigger than the ones I bought. I mean, they're kind of so close, they're bigger, and I'm talking to the Lord the whole time. And I do that with everything now, praise the Lord. Um, talking with the Lord, and like uh, Brother Christ once taught me, is that sin will keep me from God's Word, or God's Word will keep me from sin. When you start getting into sin and temptation, when you start getting all prideful and arrogant and puffed up, and you start getting worldly and start doing things the world's way, it takes you away from talking to the Lord. I speak from experience. Okay? When I was newly saved, I'd get a great relationship with the Lord, but then I'd, fall, I'd start doing the sins, there were sins in my life, and I struggled with sin, it's in my testimony, about giving up video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. I was into porn when I was lost, and that transition, when God saved me, he had to get it out of my life. Okay? I was worldly, I saw things the world's way. God really had to do a lot of work on me. Okay? And that time period, when you're bouncing back and forth, I'm telling you from experience, when I started giving in and started choosing to sin, it pulled me away from God. And then God would pull me back. Either chastisement or conviction, but you lose your, if you're truly saved and born again, you lose your joy, you lose your peace. When you start falling into sin and worldliness, you start losing that joy and that peace that God gives you. All right? You lose it. And, and you start getting convicted and you're, you're miserable and God brings you, gets you to go, Lord, I'm miserable, Lord. Wait a minute, it's been, it's been two weeks since I've read the Bible. It's been two weeks since I've prayed. Lord, and you go back to the Lord, remember me. And you start talking to the Lord. He's like, you see that stuff you gave up for me? You're starting to do it again. You see that over there? Uh, the way you're doing that is wrong. How you've treated the brethren, brother or sister in Christ over there is wrong. Your pride needs to go. Your arrogance needs to go. Uh, you need to be humble. You need to have charity. Uh, you need to make sure you're walking the straight path, sanctification. And you start talking with the Lord, and next thing you know, He gives you the strength. In weakness, He gives you the strength to get all that stuff back out again and get back to your walk with the Lord. Remember what Jesus said, If any man will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, daily, every day, and follow me. Okay? Uh, Proverbs 3, verse, you don't have to turn here, but Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And everything. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not on thine own understanding. There's times that things are not going to happen the way we want them to happen. And God knows why. But, but when bad things happen, not saying but to ignore that, but, but I'm saying but again. And I don't want to say ever. But the point of this, I'll say but, but the point of this video is that when you do go through that hard time, and you don't understand don't, your own understanding. I don't understand, Lord. I'm trying to figure it out with my own understanding, and I don't get it. You go to God, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, why did this happen? And sometimes he might tell you, or he might show you years down the road. You look back and go, ah, oh, that's why that happened. Or that's why I didn't get that. Okay. There's also times you look back and go, I forced that. How many of you had regrets where you look back, where you bought something, and you're like, you wish I had waited? Or you force something that, that you're like, I could have had, God had opened doors later that now I can't do it because I made the wrong decision back then. Okay, we can get in the way and screw things up. But when we're not getting in the way, 
and we're listening to God, and some things just happen. Okay? The world is falling apart. Bad things are going to happen to us, brothers and sisters Christ. We are going to be going through some tough times. But are you trusting the Lord that He knows what He's doing? God's the one that's bringing everything about in this world. We've got to fight. We've got to fight. You can't fight what's going on in the world. Why? Because you're going to be fighting against God. God's not for the sin of the world, but He's allowing it to happen. He's bringing everything together for the time of Jacob's trouble. He's bringing everything together because we're going to have the catching away of the body of Christ. Right? Proverbs 28, 11 says, The rich man is wise in his own conceits. Yeah, Money changes people. I don't care what you say. Money, I mean, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it like that. Forgive me. I do care what you say, brother, says Christ, but I care more about what the Bible says. The Bible says the rich man is wise in his own conceits. Money changes people. When you're poor, I've said this before with preachers, in my experience with preachers, when you have a preacher that's just starting out, they hardly have anything financially and physically, like wealth-wise, they hardly have anything. And they're gung-ho for the Lord. They love the Lord. They love His Word. They just want to serve the Lord. They want to be a servant to the brethren. And they're just hardcore for the Lord. But over time, they start getting things that are distractions. They start getting things that are wealth. And it goes to, this is more important. And they're not as gung-ho as they were when they first joined the ministry. They're not as gung-ho, you know, that big of a servant to the brethren and servant to God as they were when they first got into ministry. They've got all these distractions. Now they've got all these extra responsibilities that are trying to pull them away from ministry. And it usually has to do with wealth. Right. You will, I, I'm sorry, but you will never convince me of a great preacher that's a millionaire. Right. You won't. Money changes people. The rich man is wise in his own conceits. But the poor that hath understanding searcheth him out. Well, poor that hath understanding. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I remember watching a teaching by Peter Ruckman where he comes through and says, and uses that verse and he says, do you still sin? Well, then how do you explain that? And I, I sat there and I was like, simple. When you sin, are you going through Christ or are you going through the flesh? When you sin, are you going through Christ? Or are you going through the world? Doing things the world's way. Your flesh's way or the world's way. Those are the three things you can go through. Your flesh, the world, or through Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. What do we read up there? That uh, in strength, let's see. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. I can do all things through Christ. When I am weak, He is strong. When I start getting all uppity and being strong about, and it's me and myself, remember we just talked about, um, I want to make sure, Rachel, I almost want to say Sarah, Rachel, yelling at Jacob, it's your fault, it's your fault, and getting mad, it's world, and her way of thinking is worldliness, and being worldly, okay? She's trying to be strong, and she's trying to solve the problem herself. It's your fault, it's your fault, and you need to do this, and she's trying to do it all herself. Uh, no. When I'm weak, then am I strong? Who did Hannah go to? The Lord. I'm weak. This isn't happening. I want children. It's not happening. Who'd she go to? The Lord. When you have hard times and tough things going on, who do you go to? The Lord. You don't start saying, well, I got it all planned out, you know. These tough times are coming, and, and I've got it all planned out and everything, and I'm going to prep, 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 and, and I've got it taken care of, and I'm going to save myself in these hard times. Okay. Now, I want to say one thing real quick. God designed it so what, how we're supposed to live is we, it's not that we were preppers, because I'm not a prepper, and I'll never be a prepper. I just want that to, to I'm, I'm not going to be a prepper. Okay. Why? Because I'm doing things God's way. And how we're supposed to do things is, is we're supposed to, when you have summertime, the harvest, you're, and this isn't prepping, but you're supposed to have enough food. That's why I'm learning how to jar food, can food, and whatnot. And you make sure you have enough food to make it through the winter, through the spring, to the next harvest year. And you make sure you make it through one year, one year, one year. And then you get back to work. 
trying to, to, to survive the next year. That's not prepping. That's how we're supposed to do things. Prepping is, you know, I've got to make it through five or six years, seven or eight, nine, ten years. Okay? Um, I'm not a prepper. Okay, I trust the Lord. Now, I've always told the brethren, get into, get into fishing around you, get into hunting, get into growing things. I have a garden, praise the Lord, by His glory uh, and His, His blessing. And his mercy, he's like, because I'm not a plant person. The fact that I'm able to grow anything is a, is a miracle in itself. Um, but I've always been pushing that, hey, try to start growing your own foods. Start canning. I've uh, been able to can uh, tuna. I've got a lot of tuna up there. Enough, I, I believe I have enough up there for a year to two years. Um, I've got enough meat in my freezer for the next year to year and a half and it's not because I'm prepping because I I know hard times are around the corner that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because that's what we're supposed to do we're supposed to have try to store up food every year and then we go through it and then we store it up again and then we go through it that's what we do but you need to get into some growing food I'm not I'm not trying to say sit there and do nothing sit there and twiddle your thumbs and do nothing I'm just gonna sit here and twiddle my thumbs and do nothing no the Bible says if you don't work neither shall you eat you're supposed to work. You're supposed to try to grow some food. You're supposed to get some work and, and, and get some food. In America, we've, I know I'm going off a little on a rabbit trail, but in America, we've gotten so dependent on the grocery stores that most, you know, I remember growing up, we had food that lasted a month, if that. And we were about going to the grocery stores to buy food every month. How many of you have your monthly grocery buy, you know? I still go and buy like a little stuff here and there, like bread and whatnot. But I'm saying with we, uh, the American home here in America, the home was predominantly just dependent month after month. Payday comes around, we're out of food. Now we got to go to the grocery stores to get food. And like I said, it could get hard enough times so that you go to the grocery stores and there's hardly any food there. That's why you need to start. The solution is not prepping. The solution is you need to get back into providing for yourself. If a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. Providing for your own by hunting, fishing, growing food. If you say, well, I, I, I'm horrible at that. I don't know. You're looking at a man who's horrible at it. But God has blessed me. I started learning how to fish again. I started learning how to... I, I've been blessed I don't have to hunt. <laughs> There's a situation where God might open doors for you where I didn't have to hunt the bear that I got recently. Uh, a neighbor and I got it from the um, lumber mill and the forestry service area. Okay, There's a whole situation behind that. They have to put bears down sometimes. And when they do, there's a list of guys that have hunting licenses that they put their names on there saying, we'll take the bear so the bear doesn't go to waste. And we got the bear. It was a blessing. I didn't have to go hunt the bear. Okay, hunting something I'm really, really not good at. Okay hitting something, <laughs> you know, I'm not really that good at it, but I trust the Lord that if it came down to it and I had to go out there and hunt, I have the means because God's provided it, that, and I tried a couple times, uh, uh, he would help me get something to bring home for food. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat, but the point is I'm making is you work for your food. The solution is not prepping. The solution is learning to provide for yourself, growing your own food. In fact, that's the healthiest way to, to live. Okay? Sorry for going off too much on that, but a lot of people are starting to rely on their own strength and their own understanding, and they're trying to push this prepping, prep, 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 prep. Of course, I've got food for the next six months to a year to a year and a half. Okay, I understand having some food like that, but that food ain't gonna last but uh, six months, a year, a year and a half. What happens when that food's gone and there's no food in the grocery stores? Now you're back. You're you're in a worse state then than you are now. You want to protect yourself. Trust the Lord and say, Lord, help me. I know a brother in Christ up there in um, Canada that he turned. I'd said this before. He turned one of his rooms, and I forget what you call it, but he he turned it into uh, a garden. Because it's, it's a lot it's snow up there a lot of times of the year. But he was able to turn it into a garden. And he grew, uh, um, what was it, tomatoes was a big one. And he grew other uh, vegetables, but he did that. There's brethren that have said, talked to me and said, hey, I've uh, balconies. 
I have an apartment and I have a very small balcony, but God, I prayed to the Lord. He helped me. God helped me organize it and set up a way where we can put food and everything and start growing food on the balcony. Uh, by the sliding door, we have on the one side of the sliding door, it'll slide, but the one side we have racks and we put, so the sun shines through that, that the glass door and you can set up garden inside the house and start growing foods inside the house. God will provide a way. Okay? You have to trust the Lord and you have to seek Him. Okay? I can do all things through Christ with strength of me. The whole thing about the prepping, and I'll end it with this, it's, the solution is not prepping. It's not storing as much food as you possibly can. The solution is learning to grow your own food. Okay, The land hasn't become desolate yet, praise the Lord. He's still watching over us. The land hasn't become desolate. The doors here, like I said, you think it would because Oregon's really hardcore trying to get do away with hunting and fishing. The doors are still open. I'm allowed to hunt and fish. Okay. God is watching over us, brother Jesus Christ. He's keeping doors open. Do you trust the Lord? Lord, I remember you. Remember me. Lord, I know who you are. You're the one in charge. Romans 8.28. Here's another one. Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good. Kind of jumped that really fast, but Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. I love Peter Ruckman. I believe he's a saved man, and I learned a lot from that man. But he said that this is unconditional, and I disagree with him. It is very conditional. Let's break down the verse real quick. Okay. To them that love God. John 14, 23. Turn to John 14. I need to go back. If a man love me, because it's talking about to them that love God, what does it mean to love God? A lot of people think it's just this feeling I have, it's just my words, it's just us going, ah. Is that what loving God is according to the scriptures? Let's see what loving God is. Some, sometimes those people, I try to tell them and show truth to them, and they don't want truth. The professing Christians out there. I'm like, this is what God's Word says. Okay. To them love God, John 14, 23. And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So what does it mean to love God? Jesus is God, fully and completely. What does it mean to love God? You're keeping his word. So we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are trying to do in their best, heartfelt desire to keep his word. To them that are called, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. In other words, I didn't choose this. It was a calling. God chose it. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace to be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Now here's where we get into this. Remember what we read over here. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called. Verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. To them, uh, to them who are called. This is talking about saved sinners. Okay. And you, brother, says Christ, can fall out of fellowship with the Lord and start trying to resurrect the old man. You start acting foolish. Remember, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The word fool is for a lost person. But you can start acting 
like a lost person again. You can start being or acting foolish. In other words, there's no distinction. You start acting like the world, looking like the world, talking like... You can start falling back into the old man. Okay? You can have someone come along and try to take away your assurance of salvation. In a bad way. There's a good way, and there's a bad way. I don't want to go off too much on it because it's a whole other thing, but I'm glad someone got me to uh, doubt my salvation when I was a false convert. Part of the Babel building goers and easy believism, uh, Bible perversions didn't have a clue who God really was. They didn't have a clue about the Word of God. Uh, but I, I was a professing Christian. Professing. Okay, claiming the title for myself. Right. Someone came along and doubted my salvation. Praise the Lord, there's, that's a good way. And then there's times where Satan will come along with his minions and try to get you to doubt your salvation. It's a bad way. Okay. what's going on here someone's coming in and trying to get them messed up to another gospel all that gospel that you you that wasn't the right one and i've come across brethren who got saved with a true plan of salvation repentance towards god what's repentance sorrow it's godly sorrow that worketh repentance to salvation repentance is your change of heart your heart goes from loving sin to being sorry, sorrow, sorry for your personal sins that you've sinned against God, your Creator, and those sins are sending you to hell, and you're sorry. That's what true repentance is. And faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Those are the steps that lead you to God's grace, salvation, God saving you. For by grace are you saved. Okay? You have to go through that faith. And all those things, those steps that I mentioned. There's been brethren that have gotten saved off of that, and they start getting talked out of that gospel. No, that really wasn't the right gospel. You, must have got, you might think you got saved off that gospel, but that really wasn't the right gospel. It's not the true gospel. It's only believe. Only believe. And people, some brethren are starting to fall away. They're getting confused. They want to be part of this group that's easy believism, and they start falling away. And Paul comes to the Galatians and says, someone's coming in here, and they're messing everything up. Who's that someone? Predominantly the Jews. Uh, today, the, the number one person uh, group that's messing everything up today is Catholicism. It's in every false religion. Okay, They're messing everything up. But back then, it was the Jews coming in, trying to get them back under the law. But notice he says, from him that called you. We read over here, it says, to them who are called. Who does the calling? God does. He does the saving, in other words. I'm not saying you can't get saved if, uh, it, like, I'm not into that, I forget what it's called, but you have to come to God broken. He's the one that does the saving. And when He saves you, when it says to them that who are called, it's talking about saved sinners in Romans 8 28. Okay? Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Okay? When you get to verse 8, let's see, I was going to read all the way to 10. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which has been preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Remember what Jesus said, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Are we supposed to be pleasing men? Are we supposed to be pleasing God first? There's nothing wrong with doing work that pleases men, but are we supposed to be pleasing men over God? No. Are we supposed to be persuade? Do I now persuade men or God? Am I supposed to try to convince God to be different to the men? Or am I supposed to be persuading the men, hey, you need to line up with God. No, or am I supposed to be telling God, no, no, God, you need to kind of line up with us. You need, you need to come down to our level. You need to kind of line up to us. And that's what's going on with a lot of these false gospels, right? these false Jesuses that are out, these antichrists, these fake Jesuses that are out there. It's about taking God and saying, you need persuading God to come down to our level. Instead of telling men, you need to go to God at his, not, not at his level, like, I can't be a God. But you need to meet God and do things on his terms. You need to be following his word. You need to be obeying him. You need to come to God. 
broken. A broken, dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. Right? To this day, I still deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. But by His grace and His mercy, the blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross has washed my sins away. Right? For yet if I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. When we read over here, to them that are called, it's talking about saved sinners. So when you read that verse, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Those are men that are doing their best to obey His word, to keep His word. Bible, the two verses I always keep memorized. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You can even throw in the third one. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Uh, there's another verse about be holy for as I am holy. Right? We're to live a life of Christ. We're supposed to obey him. We're supposed to follow him. The Bible says, ye are my friends. This is Jesus speaking. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. And this comes after he says there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. When you give your life to Christ, the old man is dead and buried. When you give your life to Christ at the cross, he gives you a new life. Some people say change life. Okay? And that changed life or new life is a life that says, now I'm doing things God's way and I'm going to obey God. He tells me what to do and I'm going to do it. Okay? That's what this is talking about here in Romans 8.28. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Okay. Why do I say this? We know that all things work together for good. The lost world can do good things. Right now there's a big fight. I've been watching some videos, but there's a big fight about morality online. Okay, um, The lost world's fighting for, for this stand, that stand, and the stand might line up with the scriptures, but they're without Jesus Christ. In the end, it will not work out together for good for them. They can live a morally, what they call, the lost world calls morals, good morals, and live a good, clean life in their eyes. Remember, man's understanding. If they reject Jesus Christ, it's not going to work together for good. In the end, they're going to wind up in hell and then to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Okay? All things work together for good to them that love God. It is conditional. To them that love God, you're doing your best to keep His Word. In my life, I can tell you now that 80%, and I'm being nice on my side, 80% of the bad things that have happened to me in my life is because I wasn't showing love for God. I started departing from His Word and doing things the world's way, doing things my way, jumping the gun with I want, I want, giving in to the flesh. I could go on and on and on. But the reason it didn't work together for good is because of me. I screwed up because I was not loving God. What's truly loving God? Doing your best to keep His Word. Hide it in your heart and live it. Okay? To them that are called according, that are called, and now we're going to talk about according to His purpose. Okay? What this is talking about is you're doing your best to live for God, hide His Word in your heart, you're saved, you're born again, that's the most important thing, because then you're going to be able to hide God's word in your heart, because the Holy Spirit comes in and guides us into all truth. Okay? According to his purpose. Okay? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. We just read that. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for thee. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12. 
1 Corinthians 12. My grace is sufficient for thee, according to his purpose. God has a purpose. And our own understanding, we're not to lean on our own understanding. God's got a reason it's going to happen. He has a purpose. 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. I was going to emphasize that because I know some brethren that are starting to fall back into dumb idols. Culture, heritage. Uh, this is my heritage. This is the life I'm supposed to be living now. Unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, not is Lord, or is a Lord, it's the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now remember, I've always told you, it's not just words, it's deeds. The Bible, I, can't, I don't have the verse on, on the top of my head, but there's a verse talking about how in words and in deed do all to the glory of God. Your words and your deeds need to line up. So if you say Jesus is the Lord, does your life reflect that? If Jesus is the Lord, Lord of Lords, He's top. Nobody down here, you're going to listen to Him over everybody down here. You're going to obey His commands over everybody's commands down here. The worldliness, remember I told you, my own flesh, the world. He's the Lord. Lord of your life. He commands, you obey. Okay? It goes hand in hand. It's not just saying it, because people try to do this thing about, if, I, if they say it, then they're true. No. The, the Satan can lie. It's the life, your words, and your deeds need to line up. Now, there are div diversity of gifts by the same Spirit, and there are diver divergence of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are di diversity of operations, but is the same God which worketh all and in all. Okay, and you can keep re reading down and everything, okay? And it talks about God gives gifts as he sees fit to different people. I don't have all the gifts that are in here, okay? One of them, the gift of tongues. I'm bad with foreign languages, okay? I am. Um, there's, uh, he gives people different gifts. God's the one in charge, okay? When it says to his purpose, it's his purpose. It's for his glory. We're here to please God. Do all to the glory of God. Okay, give thanks in all things, but we're here for God's glory and for His purpose. So when you're reading that, Romans 8, 28, it's, I'm sorry I had to go through that really hardcore, because some people are saying, oh, it's, it's unconditional. It is very conditional. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, that take His word and hide Him in your heart, starting with to them who are called the gospel that's found in this book right here according to his purpose. Okay? God is glorified in us when we seek him, rely on him, and live his word in us. There are many times when we need to become less and less so that he can become more. He divides to every man as he wills. God is glorified in us when we seek him. Rely on him and live his word in us. There are many times when we need to become less and less so that he can become more. He divides to every man as his will. Remember me. You start remembering the Lord. He's the one in charge. He's the one that saved me. He's the one that gave me his word. Uh, one of the prayer requests. Uh, one of the verses that I, I read in the prayer requests is, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Right? Sometimes brethren get lazy and they start relying on people like me or other men trying to get into ministry, and you start relying on them to give you wisdom and open the scriptures to you. I've learned a lot from brothers in Christ. I've learned a lot. But ultimately, we're supposed to go to God. He's the one that opens the scriptures to us. He's the one that saves us. He's the one that gives us gifts and gives us uh, purpose, okay? meaning in our life. Right? We still go to God when we say, remember me. We're remembering Him. 
John 3.24. John 3.24. Getting almost done. John 3.24. Good attitude to have. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of the John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi... He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth all men, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. Brother, sister Christ, in your life and your walk with the Lord, that's the attitude we're supposed to have. Lord, I need to be putting this flesh down and I must decrease so that God can increase in your life. As a man that I feel God's called me to preach and teach his word, at some point, I need to become less and less, and God needs to become more and more in your life. You need to be doing your own Bible studies, word studies, subject studies, expository studies. You need to be taking these words and applying them, hiding them in your heart, and applying them to your life. Okay, God, Jesus needs to be number one in your life. Not me, not this world, not your flesh. Jesus Christ needs to be number one in your life. Okay, mm -hmm. That's the whole point. When you say, remember me, what you're doing is realizing that, hey, I need to remember God. And He needs to be number one. He's the one in charge. He's the foundation. He's the capital R rock. All right. Ephesians 5.20, you know, I'm turning here, but Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, t I gave a situation where something didn't go right. Okay? And I'm sitting there. Um... Giving God glory. Give Him thanks when things don't go right. We still need to give God glory and give God thanks. If we've screwed up, we need to come to God and humble ourselves, drop our pride and our egos, and we need to apologize to the Lord and repent when we do things wrong, make bad decisions, start doing things the world's way, when we've offended the brethren. Okay, I need to do that. You need to do that. But when things are going wrong and it's out of your control, of not of your making, okay, we need to give God thanks. Mm -hmm. And when God, and I'll say this too, and when God gets you out of the trouble that you caused, you give God thanks, okay? Giving God thanks, so in a way, you're giving God thanks always for all things. God can get you out of the trouble you got yourself into, and you give God thanks when the world's causing the trouble. And you trust the Lord that He knows what He's doing. Colossians 3.17 reads, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, there it is, word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Your words and your, your, words and your deeds, I'm doing this like moving, <laughs> your deeds, your actions, need to line up. Okay? They need to line up. What you actually do needs to line up with your words. The Bible says when, they don't, when that doesn't happen, you're a hypocrite. I'm sorry, that's not that's not the word. Uh, hypocrites, when you um, call someone out for doing something when you're doing the same thing. So yeah, it is a hypocrite. Because you're verbally saying, that's wrong, but your actions, you're doing the same thing they're doing. It can be part of hypocrisy. But your words and your deeds need to line up. 2 Corinthians 10, 17, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, not this world. No, don't be putting faith in uh, uh, too much faith in me, brothers and sisters of Christ, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. I make mistakes. Okay? I don't want to make mistakes. I don't want to sin against God. I don't want to wrong the brethren. I don't want to make mistakes when I'm teaching the Word of God. But I'm, I'm a man. My flesh can get in the way. The world can get in the way. Right? I can make mistakes. 
When you glory, you glory in the Lord. Don't be a respecter of persons. Don't think the world. Don't start getting into doing things the world's way, like Rachel. World's way. Okay. Being worldly and thinking and thinking like the world does. Right? Holy Spirit comes in, gives you the helps you to to fit. So God will open the scriptures to you to teach you how to live, and how you're supposed to think and how you're supposed to look at things. Okay. The hardest time to give glory to God, the hardest time to give God glory and thanks, and I know a lot of brethren out there can testify to this. The hardest time to give God glory and thanks is when you are going through hard times. Especially if you're the reason you're going through hard times. Like I said, 80% of my hard times, it was my fault. It wasn't the world oppressing me because I'm a Christian. And that's there sometimes. But I'm telling you, when I lose my joy and I lose my peace, it's not because I'm being persecuted for Jesus Christ. It's because I screwed up. Okay? But the hardest times to give God thanks and glory is when you're going through hard times, whether it's of your own making or it's because of the lost world. When bad things are happening to you, when you're not getting your way, you're not getting the I wants, I wants. Right. Remember me. Remember me. God's wanting you to remember Him. Remember who I am. Remember what I've done for you. Right? When I'm going through hard times, I just start praying to the Lord, and I just start talking to Him about anything and everything. I talk about my past, the thing, and God brings to light the things that He did for me in my past. Number one, He saved me from myself. He saved me from hell. And we start talking. And then I start making requests to God, Lord, I'd like to have this, I'd like to have that. Oh Lord, please. And you make requests. And you trust God, hard times that are coming. Uh, I believe we're always been going through hard times. There's times you can be going through hard times and God will give you peace and joy and it's not as hard as, as, as people are going to make it out to be for you, but to someone who's lost, who does not have the Holy Spirit, they don't have Jesus, they don't have that peace and that joy that God gives, to them, you're going through the same thing they're going through and to them it's 50 times harder. Why? They don't have Jesus Christ. They need Jesus Christ. So no matter what the hard times are, make sure that you're giving God glory in all things. Make sure you're going to God and you're trusting Him. Saying, Lord, I don't understand this, but it's happening. Lord, if it's, I did something wrong, help me correct it. If I didn't do something wrong, help me get through this, O oh Lord. I don't understand. Help me get through this, O oh Lord. And help me to continue to serve you and to praise you and to give you glory through the whole thing. 2 Corinthians 4.15 2 Corinthians 4.15 For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. See, it redounds. When I'm giving God thanks in all things, and you hear it, and I'm not doing it for your sake, but you hear it, you start going, well, it starts... Uh, convicting you, I need to be doing it. And then that brother says, Christ, it redounds back to God. Mm -hmm. We're all given thanks that the abundance of grace might through the thanksgiving of many, we all start giving thanks to God. It redounds to the glory of God. The lost world sees it too. Why are you praising God? Uh, Paul, Peter, John, you've been beaten. You're in shackles. You've been starved. Why are you praising God? Why are you singing hymns and praising God? And it's an open door. And they start preaching the gospel to him. Especially the, what is it, the, the jailer comes in, finds them all still there, falls on his knees in a repentant state. He saw what they went through. He heard them in prison singing praises to God. And he comes running in and falls at his knees. It was an open door. It redounded to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but through our out, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. 
When you're going through hard times and you're starting to forget to remember the Lord and you're just saying and you start to say remember me, one of the songs I love that got me through some tough times where I screwed up and God still saved me and got me back on the right path and he used that mistake for me to learn from and to grow from. One of the songs that got me through was the the, uh, the hold him day by day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find, God's strength He gives me, strength I find, to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. It's a great song. I still sing it to this day. I, I'm trying to add new songs, but I still love that one. Where do we get that from? The inward man is renewed day by day. You're to take up your cross daily. The outward man perish. We get older. This body of flesh is falling apart. This body of flesh is always trying to destroy me, trying to tempt me. Right? But the inward man is renewed day by day. Right? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not for the things which are seen, worldliness, but the things which are not seen, eternal, temporal, eternal. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Brothers of Christ, eternal. Okay? Remember me. Lord, remember me. Are you remembering God? When you go up there and say, Lord, remember me, you're going to God. Are you treating him as he is, as who he is? The capital L Lord. He's the one in charge. Okay? He's the one that given you his word and opens his word to you. He's the one that saved you. He's the one that's blessed you with what you have. Right? The gifts that he's given you to use for his glory. Do you remember who he is when you say, remember me? Right? Keep your eyes on the eternal, not the temporal. No matter how hard it gets, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the next few years, if we're still here, because I haven't turned my back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ, he could come back right now as I'm doing this video and take us home. If we're still here, remember who the Lord is. And remember to keep your eyes on the eternal things. And living for the Lord eat every day, no matter what. No matter how hard it, it gets. Don't change how you treat the lost world because of how hard it gets. Don't change how you treat the brothers and sisters in Christ because of how hard it gets. Don't turn your back on this book because we go through it because it gets hard out there. It's just temporal. This life is just but a blink of an eye compared to eternity, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't forget the judgment seat of Christ. Don't forget the rewards. Don't forget the inheritance. Don't forget eternity. We get to be with our Lord and Savior forever. Whatever we have to go through down here, we go through. But don't let us forget who it is that's in charge. No matter how hard it gets out there or the hard times that we go through, no matter what happens, don't forget who's in charge and who we're supposed to turn to when we need help. Times get tough, we turn to Jesus Christ. We don't turn to our own strength and what we do will save us. I'm going to do something to save us. Lord, save me. Lord, help us through these hard times. Help provide in these hard times. He's provided me a garden. He's provided me means to go fishing and hunting. God has provided means. He's provided for me. Okay, remember, you still have to work. If man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. But we go to God to provide, and God provides. So I will end this study with grace and peace. Grace and peace from God our Father. Be with you all, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you. Action. Love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, 
Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.